Hello guys, welcome to INE's Network Security Fundamentals and Concepts video course. I am Peter Kolozny, your instructor. I have over 12 years of network and network security experience. I hold CCNA, CCNP and CCIE Cisco certifications. This course is gonna be beneficial especially for newcomers to network security like people who are looking to obtain their CCNA security certification or simply want to start learning about network security. In this series of videos I'm gonna cover basic security terminology and concepts. And my goal is to give you the foundations of foundations so when you get to actual technologies you will not have to stuck asking yourself questions such as what is a firewall or what is an intrusion prevention system and in the same time you will also learn about certain network security appliances this is going to be a very high level overview of the different types of network security devices commonly deployed to protect a network this course is gonna start with a discussion on network security concepts then I'm gonna make an overview of intrusion prevention next we will take a look at content and endpoint security then we will discuss access control and then we will finish with one additional module about some of the emerging technologies thank you guys for watching this short introduction I hope you find the entire course useful and let's get started. Hello and welcome everyone. This is INE's Network Security Fundamentals and Concepts video course. My name is Peter Kolesne. I will be your instructor throughout this series. I am a Cisco certified associate, professional and expert I have over 12 years of network experience, including network security. There is just one formal prerequisite to this video course, which is to know really the basics of networking. And we will not talk about things such as switching, routing, or maybe differences between routers and switches. I assume that you already possess this knowledge. We will start in module one with an overview of security principles we will then take a look at certain attacks but it's not only going to be network attacks uh, we will take a look at threats IT threats in general I will give you examples of certain groups of threats we will make an overview of what bad could potentially happen to our network Next, I'm gonna take a look at intrusion prevention systems. We will talk about IDS, IPS solutions. Module four is all about email security fundamentals, just a high level overview. We will do a similar thing for web security systems. Module six discusses endpoint security fundamentals. Module seven is covering A2.1x authentication just a theory and module 8 discusses one of the more recent concepts related to networking that is called bring your own device BYOD I hope you guys find this introductionary course useful thank you and I'll see you in the class in this session we will talk a little bit about different terms and concepts related to security and I would like to start with the different types of data. There are actually two main ways to classify the information at a very high level. We have a data which is sitting in one place, like on a storage media, maybe a laptop, maybe a hard drive. This is what is known as data at rest. And then which is, which is actually as opposed to the data in motion, like when your data is moving throughout the network. Maybe you are sending a file from your network to someone else. So data at rest is, is information that doesn't move. It just sits in one place versus data in motion is 
is the information which is being sent exchanged over a network. Now, as far as those different security terms and concepts go, well, I talked about the types of data in the, uh, initially here in the beginning of this session because there are going to be actually different ways or just methods to um, secure this data depending on what type of data we are dealing with. So some solutions are going to work for both, for the data addressed and in motion versus some others will only work for the data at rest. And the first security term I've got here is a CIA triad, which is what describes a model used in information security to ensure free critical functions or just elements of a secure environment. We have what is known as confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, if you think about confidentiality, it's basically, it's basically a, a process of ensuring that certain information is hidden from unintended parties. Like you, you own the data, uh, but you only want to make this data available to specific recipients, um, maybe the other organization, maybe someone within your own organization. But you don't want people from the outside to be able to either get this data or basically read it. And now if you think about the different types of data, the, the data at rest and in motion, now in, in this first case, there are actually at least two different method solutions you could use to ensure confidentiality of the information. You could like uh, um, take the, this hard drive where you have those files, where you store the files, and you could put this hard drive into um, some sort of a cabinet, secure cabinet, lock it, and as long as you're the only guy who owns the key, no one else is going to be able to get read this, this data. This is obviously a simplified um, explanation, but I think it, it makes sense. Um, the other solution you could potentially use here would be to encrypt the, that information on that hard drive. You could actually combine these two solutions, but in case of data in motion, you will uh, probably not be able to do that. Because when, when, we, when we talk about the data which is moving throughout the network, well, even if your organization, your own organization is actually secure, it doesn't mean that the, the network that you will be using as a transport when you send this information from your organization to someone else, it doesn't mean that those networks in the middle are also going to be secured. So someone could potentially see this information and here locking this data to a cabinet obviously is not going to work. So the way we could implement confidentiality at that point would be to use, for example, encryption. And a similar process is going to apply, similar logic I should say, is going to apply to integrity of the information. Integrity in general refers to uh, keeping the data in its original state or just ensuring that the data was not modified at any point of its existence. No matter if you're keeping the data on a server, you store the files in a single location, maybe in multiple locations, you want to make sure that this data stays, remains unchanged. The only people who are, or systems which are allowed to modify the data are those authorized systems or authorized individuals. You don't want anyone from that group to be able to modify this information. And the same logic applies when you, when you send the data over a network. Obviously what I send to my peer, I want to make sure that my peer gets the same stuff what I sent in the first place. I don't want those other parties to, well, excuse me, the, I don't want my uh, intended destination to get something else than I initially sent. Now, this would mean that my data was modified and integrity is supposed to ensure that this is not going to happen. Now, technically not that this is not going to happen, but the, any potential modification of the data is going to be detected. And like in the previous case, if we are talking about the data and rest. What we could do is going to be to lock this information to a cabinet, you know, physically secure the files, and as long as only authorized individuals have access to them, everything should be fine. But as long as the data is moving through the network, well here the situation is going to be different. We'll probably use 
something else um, which is going to be known as a hashing function to ensure the integrity of the information that we are exchanging for the network. And finally, there's also something which is known as availability. Um, this is what ensures what, I mean, this term describes a process of ensuring that our data information remains available to the end users. And at a some sort of a level, I mean, the, there are different, you know, needs of different organizations, the different levels that uh, you want to make the data available on, like it could be, you know, those five nines where you want the data to be available 99.999% of the year, but in some other environments, 95% might be acceptable. So it depends on the on the specific needs, but obviously the goal in general is to keep that information, uh, make this information available, well, ideally forever. This is this is not going to be the case, unfortunately, uh, pretty much in any environment. We know that even when you build redundant environments, redundant solution, there is always something that was, that was not predicted that can go, that can happen, and is going to eventually uh, lead to losing that availability. Now a couple other terms related to information security um, and security in general. We have what is known as principle of least privilege, which generally describes a process of ensuring that our system or individual will function, will perform its functions with a minimum set of privileges, or in other words, the the privileges, the, the rights a system or individual has allow that individual or that system to function properly to perform all of its required functions. So in simple words, we can say that you don't really want to allow uh, a given device or a given employee to do something more than that person or system needs to do to perform its, its work. Like an example I can give you is, well, think about a switch with, uh, with multiple switch ports. One of those switch ports go to a printer. And we know that the role of a printer is just to print the documents. So the question is, how would you actually implement the principle of least privilege on that given switch and this particular switch port so that the printer can handle its, its task, can function? Well, obviously the way you would do that would just to allow the printer to connect to a printing server and block all other communication. Because you could potentially open access to, to everywhere, like allow all communication from that network printer to everywhere, including Telnet, you know, SQL-based communication, SSH, HTTP. But the question is, does the printer actually need those services to function? And the answer is no. The only thing that the printer needs to be able to access is going to be that server, which is somewhere in the middle of our network. So here, a solution would be allow just this single connectivity and then block everything else. Another term related to security we have here is defense in depth, which now describes a process of deploying multiple solutions and multiple mechanisms in our system, in our environment to secure it. So in other words, we don't really want to rely on a single technology like a single solution to protect our system. And this, this concept goes even one step further. Uh, so we will be deploying multiple different types of solutions, different mechanisms, and in addition to that, for individual mechanisms, we will potentially also deploy them at multiple places in our environment. Like think about the firewalls. Um, you'll probably want to have one at the, in the internet edge, but how about if you put another one in the data center? This, this is obviously not going to hurt. You want to have those firewalls at different places so that when one level, one of those mechanisms is somehow compromised, you still have a backup, you still have some other solutions in that, in that system which could stop the, the attack from spreading any further. 
Uh, now, in certain environments, and this is actually a pretty common practice, let, let's just stick to those firewalls. Uh, what people do is that they, in addition to deploying those firewalls in multiple places, like on the edge, on the end host, in the data center, they also rely on multiple vendors when they, when they deploy those solutions. Because there is always a potential that something, something wrong happened in the, in the code, the, or just there is a problem, there is a bug in the appliance, hardware appliance itself. And if you, all your devices come from a single vendor, this single bug can be, can be you know, exploited and, and in multiple leverage in multiple places. A separation of duties, this one applies more to just the individuals. Um, so the separation of duties is supposed to ensure that you have more than one person to perform a given task or a operation. So instead of relying on just one, just one employee to perform a specific function, like for example, administer firewalls, you'll have at least two people so they can act as a backup to each other, like when one of those guys goes for vacation, maybe um, got sick, you want to have someone who's going to be able to, to take over the, the responsibilities. You want to have the backup. And this is also needed to prevent against theft of the data and against fraud in general. This one applies more, more specifically to the financial environments. Last but not the least, we have accounting and auditing, which is a process of keeping a record of what is going on in our environment. We want to know exactly what happens, when it happens, and who is making changes if there are some changes being made. So it's like a process of logging of those activities that happen in our network for so we can access this um, information at a later time. And now a couple terms related specifically to the security of information. Um, an asset is going to be anything in our organization that has a value to us. It could be something tangible like um, let's say a computer or just any other piece of hardware or it could be something intangible like intellectual property like a list of contacts or just uh, information in general. Then we've got a threat which is anything that can pose a danger to our assets and it doesn't necessarily have to be an attacker like a hacker. It could be a malicious software like virus, some other sort of uh, malware. It could be a, an environmental disaster. So there is uh, actually, there are multiple groups of those threats and, and we will actually discuss uh, about some of those groups in this session. We have what is known as a vulnerability, which is, which is a weakness that could be potentially leveraged by an attacker to compromise our asset. Like you have a, a web server which is running the, um, the old code, it wasn't patched, there is a hole in that software and when this hole is exploited by an attacker, someone can get unauthorized access to the system. We'll actually talk about this in just a second. I will try to visualize the, those different terms, how they do match to each other. The next thing we have here is a risk. A risk is, is kind of like a chance or a probability um, for compromising an asset. Then we have a countermeasure, which is our tool, a solution that we can potentially deploy to minimize or mitigate a risk. And then the process, the procedure that deals with identifying, assessing, prioritizing, and monitoring risks is known as risk management. And the goal of this procedure is going to be to either mitigate the risks or eliminate those, I mean minimize the risks or eliminate those risks completely. So just to visualize this, this stuff uh, before we talk about the classification of some of those components. Now let's take a look at a short example here. Okay, so let's say that we have a, let's say that we have a web server. And this web server is going to be our asset here. 
in the organization. This is going to be one of the tangible assets. Then uh, let's say that at some point we realized we, we decided to perform a risk management. Well, risk management is technically an ongoing process, but let's say that at some point we, during the identification phase, we employed an external penetration testing team. We want to run a pen test in our organization to figure out if there are going to be some vulnerabilities in our network environment or, or not. We are doing this penetration test and we have just found a vulnerability in this server. Maybe this server was actually like a three-year-old software that was not patched for some reasons and it contains multiple different vulnerabilities. We just focus on this single single one. Well, does it mean that this device is automatically compromised? No, it, it, it's obviously not the case, but there is, there is a certain risk which we will try to predict or just calculate that, well, that says that someone, there is a threat, there is a potential from, for exploiting this vulnerability and this way compromising our asset. So this is going to be that threat, something that we, have to, that we have to worry about. And at the end of this risk management process, what we should do is we should come up with um, some sort of a countermeasure, which in that case would simply mean to patch this server. to either minimize the risk of leveraging that vulnerability or ideally completely eliminate that risk. Okay, one more thing that we want to talk about in this session is going to be a classification of our assets, of our vulnerabilities, and finally countermeasures. And we generally do this so we can simplify the, the process of risk management and make this whole process more efficient. So in case of assets, the reason why we classify them is so we know exactly what we have in our network. So we can tell which assets are more or less important than the other ones. And this is obviously to, to better secure what we have. Now, the, the way we will probably use to classify those assets, we'll be looking at multiple different elements like the, the financial cost, of an asset, the overall replacement cost, usefulness, and maybe how low, how old an asset is. So once we have the, the assets classified, kind of like grouped together, we should be able to come up with a better, uh, with a better policy to, uh, to secure them. Now, assuming that the asset that you have is an information, there's also a concept of an additional classification that both the government and regular organizations um, use, to, which, which is related to describing how important a, a given a data is. And we have, in case of the governmental or just also military classification, we have five different levels that are being associated with our uh, data. We have the information that is unclassified, and that in turn means that information has, is not, is not critical to the organization in any way. Um, it, can, it is publicly available and there is essentially no, no reason to protect this information. The sensitive but unclassified means that if the information was revealed to the public, it could, could, uh, could be somewhat embarrassing if, if that happened. The confidential means that information basically must be secured. Secret says that, well, it should be known to just few individuals, um, not to, to many people, just to few individuals in the, in the government unit. And top secret is, is something which is essentially critical to the, uh, to the organization. Only a few individuals on a per use case basis should have access to that data. In case of the public um, classification for just regular organizations, it's, it's quite similar. We have just one level less, 
but the logic is quite quite the same so we have the public data which is something that is available to everyone we don't really have to protect that information it could be a web page you know um, a, a document like an announcement which is it doesn't have to be protected in any way we have sensitive information which once revealed could be embarrassing to the organization we have private classification level which is for something that we really want to protect because it is important for our organization to keep it secret like you know the trade secret stuff like that and finally something that is confidential which has a huge importance for us as an organization this is critical data that we want to protect at all costs. In case of vulnerabilities, uh, we will be classifying them so we can find better solutions to protect against the uh, risks, or excuse me, against the threats, I should say, that could potentially exploit those vulnerabilities. And the, here, the classification is going to be done based on the types of vulnerabilities. So vulnerabilities can be found in multiple levels, at different levels in our system environment. It doesn't have to be the, the network itself. It doesn't have to be something which is related to the configuration of our system. It could be like what we have shown here. It's, it's, it could be something in the, in, that can lead to physical breach. Like you have to think about the vulnerabilities um, in all places. Uh, when you when you categorize them, so the first category here is, is physical access. This deals with with the physical security of our environment, like the building itself, like the the, the fences, the cameras, the guards. If you have them, maybe locks, access control with biometrics, stuff like that. All that deals with physical security um, is is gonna fall under this category. Then vulnerabilities that can be can be a result of human errors. We know that we are all prone to make mistakes. Um, human factors are definitely are definitely important. Then hardware and software vulnerabilities. Uh, this is what we probably I think the most. It deals with the actual devices and systems we have in the network. Uh, it could be the, the the appliances, the different types of appliances like the the problems in the hardware of those devices. It could be a vulnerability in the software, which is more common, the software which is running on top of those devices. So we have the, the different versions of the software and the, the different bugs which are commonly found in, in those different versions. We could have a problem related to the overall design of the environment. So we have to think about that. Same as about the misconfigurations or just configuration changes which are uh, which are wrong and finally the protocols the protocols themselves and the problems related to those the protocols okay and the last thing I want to talk about here is going to be the classification of our solutions countermeasures the tools that we will then deploy to to mitigate the threats mitigate the, the risk eliminate the risk so to deal the tools that will deal specifically with the threats and here uh, we are gonna divide those tools into three different categories well this first category this one is gonna be dealing with the physical security of our environment so we saw previously that physical access to the equipment for unauthorized people is one of the categories that we will we will be looking at to find vulnerabilities so here we're going to be talking about the weaknesses related to the, the physical security of the environment. And physical countermeasures are going to be used to improve those potential, fix those potential problems you might have at that point. Now probably most of the time you're going to spend here talking and thinking about the technical and logical solutions. So this deals with the actual hardware and software like choosing the right firewalls, IPS systems, designing the network, and so on. And then we have administrative countermeasures. This is dealing with those different do's and don'ts 
written documents for the organization like security policies, procedures, guidelines, and standards. An example here might be, well, obviously the security policy itself, but also a background check which could be done for a new employee and a security awareness training which is done initially for, for newcomers and then periodically on a regular basis. In this video, I would like to talk a little bit about the threats, a little bit about the attacker, attacker types, and then focus on the actual attack methods that can, can be potentially used by the attackers to target our systems. Just a quick recap on what a threat actually is. It's essentially anything that can cause a harm or damage to our system or uh, systems to our assets. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a technical thing it can be something non-technical, like an environmental disaster. In many cases, it's going to be just one of the attackers, like a human factor. So there's going to be someone who wants to attack our systems because of a certain reason. And, and those attackers, they will generally use tools, technical tools, because they are capable of doing so. They can also build their own tools to launch an attack against our system. So we, we will actually focus in this session here specifically on the different types of attacks, you know, attacks performed by attackers, by malicious actors, so by those individuals who for some reason want to attack our system. So what kind of people we might be potentially dealing with here? Well, definitely with, with, with hackers. Um, and when I say hacker here in this session and also in the other sessions, I, I will generally refer to the to those bad guys, but in fact, in reality, the bad guys are actually known as crackers. So hackers are the good guys who who might try to break to the system, but not just to do a harm. They they want to learn how a given system works, and so so to better better secure it. So crackers is the the actual term, but for most people in the industry. And again, we also do the same thing here. When I say hacker, I'm actually thinking about the bad guys. We obviously got the criminals. The criminals. Um, we have terrorists. We have people who are just disgruntled employees. We've got our competitors, and finally, foreign governments. So there are actually multiple different types of, you know, attackers. And the reason for that is that the motivation itself is different. It could be, in many cases, financial, a thing, purely financial thing. Uh, but in other cases, it could be just political, you know, stuff. In some other cases, it might be just the revenge. So this, the motivation is, is different for different individuals. And that's why we have so many types of the attackers. But those attackers, they will generally work in a similar way when they target our system or systems they will start with what is known as the reconnaissance attack. So reconnaissance attacks, this is a group of attacks uh, which is commonly fired initially. Uh, it's like a preliminary phase to the actual attack. And why? Because th during this preliminary phase, the attackers will be able to learn about our network. They will be able to discover the devices that we have within a given segment and even tell what kind of services we are running on those devices. So there is a lot of different tools we can use to fire up a reconnaissance attack. In most cases, the, it's going to be the scanning tools so, so we know what kind of devices we have, what type, and also what services are running on those devices. With a social engineering, well, this is actually a special type of attack, I would say. Because with social engineering, it, this one doesn't even need any type of technical capabilities so, so it can succeed. Social engineering refers to psychological manipulations. It's an act of trying to fool or trick people in order to obtain some confidential information. So you don't really have to be a technical guy so you can come in to a company uh, dressed like a prom like a plumber and, and you, you say you know at the reception you say that you are supposed to fix a plumbing issue just to get physical access to the facility. That would be an example of of a social engineering attack. 
Okay, another group of attack attacks is, is known as privilege escalation uh, methods. They rely on on a certain level of access to a system to expand that access further. So, like uh, you have a junior junior admin in your uh, network operations center team, and this guy is only supposed to read the configuration of your routers, maybe switches. So you put this guy into privilege level number one, user exec mode. You gave this user access to show IP interface. Maybe show IP route command was also moved down to level one. And this guy can generally read the configuration and make some basic, some sort of basic verification checks. Now, if this guy is, is smart enough to say, you know, enable on the CLI, and if you didn't take that command off level one, and this guy is also able to break the password, he could potentially access privilege level 15, and that would be an example of privilege escalation attack. So the logic is like you start with a certain level of privileges, and then you're trying to expand to get some more privileges, which are actually not intended for you. Well, code execution, it's basically an ability to, to fire up, execute an arbitrary code on a system with uh, backdoors. You know, we are talking about a software that is installed on a system that was previously compromised. So it's like when you compromise an advisor, just a system, you install a backdoor. And the reason why you want to do that is so we can then access this system back in the future in an easy way, like using Telnet or SSH to the device. With covered channels, we are going to be talking about hidden communication channels. Well, in those channels are hidden in a way that they are not known to the, um, to the network administrators or just to the owners of a given system. Like you could have a firewall in the network which is allowing TCP port 80, for example, and TCP port 80 we know is used for web communication. Someone could potentially use this port as a covert channel to send some information for the firewall. So in many cases this also means that one of your internal devices was previously compromised and someone is communicating with this device using such a covert channel. It doesn't have to be web, it could be ICMP with a special payload to signal that internal device that it should do something, but it generally it's generally a legitimate channel that is used for malicious purposes. Okay, what's gonna what's gonna happen with a trust exploitation type of attack? Now here the logic goes like that: you have uh, some sort of policy, existing policy in place, and this policy allows some systems to communicate in a certain way. And now well, the trust exploitation attack is with, with that type of attack, you will attack one of those systems and you will then try, assuming that the attack was successful, you will automatically get access to that policy, existing policy that was in place between the attack device and, the, and some other uh, system. So like let's say that you have a, let's take a look at a simple example. Let's say that we have a, you have a firewall this is going to be an ASA firewall, which is configured with a DMZ segment. And this is where you host your, uh, your websites. So we have a web server on the DMZ, and this web server is also allowed to talk to an internal SQL database. So the firewall allows for this communication, like from the web server to the inside SQL device. Now how about if someone is actually able to compromise that web server, like there is an attack going on from the outside, and this web server got compromised. So normally it would mean that the attacker would, would be able to access the DMZ, but it wouldn't be able to go any further. Now since this web server has a trust relationship build, with the SQL database in a way that the ASA firewall allows communication from the web server down to the SQL server device. I was able to compromise my server. I am now able to access the SQL database 
using that existing relationship, that existing policy configured on the firewall. Okay, there is also what is known as a man in the middle attack, uh, which is a pretty broad, um, there is actually a large a number of attacks that fall under this category. Those man in the middle attacks can be performed, those man in the middle attacks can be performed at layers two, three, four, even upper layers. But the goal is, is always going to be the same. It's when someone is placing in line between the two communicating parties, in most cases, just to be able to sniff or just read the data. So it is also possible when you get access to those, those uh, packets, it is also possible to modify, in many cases, those packets. But the goal is just to put yourself in line between the existing communication, kind of like into the middle of the communication to see what, what's going on, what the device is, what do the devices exchange um, in the communication. Okay, another one we have here, uh, commonly is attack method, is known as a denial of service. And it's actually very similar to a distributed denial of service attack. So these two attacks, they have one thing in common. They have one goal. The goal is going to be to make a given service um, unavailable. Like when you want to shut a web server so that no one else, no one can access a, a web page you will fire up a DOS attack or distributed DOS attack. The difference between the two is that with a DOS, the regular denial of service, there is just one attacker which is launching the attack. In a distributed version, you have at least two attackers, at least two stations that attempt to you know, target a given system to make the services on that system unusable to stop those services. Um, in most cases, the distributed version of an attack is performed with the aid of so-called botnets, which are networks of compromised hosts or devices known as zombies. So a zombie is a station that was previously compromised by an attacker. When you have a lot of those different zombie machines, they make up what is known as a botnet, and this botnet can be then at some point activated like when the attacker sends an activation command, maybe using some sort of a covert channel to those zombie stations with an information about the target of the attack. And last but not the least, we've got password guessing and cracking techniques. There are two major attack types here. The first one is known as dictionary attack. The dictionary attack, well, both of these attacks, we've got dictionary attack and a brute force attack. The goal of these two attacks is just to break the password. Whether you're trying to guess it or crack it, like break it, you want to know what the password is so you can get access to the system. That's the goal of these two attacks. Now, the way you will perform this attack is different here. Because with dictionary attack, you will rely on some sort of an external source of information to guess or just crack the password. You will have a dictionary file with a certain amount of words, well, typically words that are commonly used for passwords, and you will be trying this word, those words one by one to see if you have a match, and this way, if you know the password. With a brute force attack, well, this is going to be different. Oh, it's a, a little bit less sophisticated solution. You will essentially try to guess a password by trying every single combination of a character and characters. Like in a very simple case, you will start with just one character, you will try all combinations, see if you found a match. If you did it, you will add another character, you will have then two characters you want to combine, you want to check all the combinations of the two. If you don't find it, if you didn't find a match, you will add another one, another one, and so on and so forth. So in many cases, you know, when you get like to up to four, maybe five characters, it's going to be a very long process what it will take for the device to, to perform an attack to guess a password using this solution. Now, the, the, the good thing, the advantage of a brute force attack is that it always guarantees you a success. It guarantees a success, but the problem here is that it might take almost forever, you know, to find a match. 
depending on how strong CPU uh, and uh, the hardware you have to that you use to perform this attack. So we will always succeed, but the problem is always with the time. So in many cases, you know, like if you guess a password in 10 years from now, it won't it probably won't really matter. In our next session, we're going to take a look at the basics or just fundamentals of intrusion detection and prevention systems. And we will take a look at the different types of devices that we can uh, deploy in our network to detect or prevent attacks. And we will talk about how to deliver the traffic to our devices for inspection. And we will also quickly look at the detection methods and actions that might be taken by our sensors. And finally, we will also briefly discuss a terminology related to IDS IPS systems. Okay, so first and foremost, what is going to be a difference between the detection and prevention systems? Because an intrusion sensor can be defined as one of these uh, two. It can either just detect the attacks, which is known as an IDS system. So an IDS is a sensor that is capable of detecting the attacks, but generally speaking is not able to stop those attacks once they are detected. Now, the way that we will be configuring our sensor as IDS, as we will see in just a second, is going to be by copying a traffic from the network to, a, to an interface of our IDS so that it can analyze those packets. And now, this in turn means that our device is going to be working on a copy of the real traffic, not on the real packets. And because of that, even when it detects the attack, it will not be able to stop it. There are actually two small exceptions to this rule. One is going to be for TCP-based connections. Our device could potentially send a TCP reset packet, and this will protect the victim from receiving the authentic package. And the other solution is going to be to rely on a different device in our network, like, for example, an iOS router or maybe ASA firewall, which we will then ask to stop the attack, like, for example, by applying an access list. Now, in case of a sensor configured as a prevention system and known as IPS, the device is not only going to be able to detect the attacks, but will be also able to stop them. So in this particular case, our sensor is going to be placed in line with the real the packet flows. It is going to be able to act on real the packets generated by our applications, the clients, so generally on the traffic that is traversing for the sensor. Now, most of the sensors available in the market today, they can be configured in one of these two modes. It is actually even possible to deploy both modes on a single a physical or virtual device. So it's going to be pretty much our configuration, which is going to eventually affect how our sensor is going to behave. Is it going to act as a detection or a prevention system? Now, if you want to deploy an IDS, you will have to configure your device, actually, technically, its interfaces in a so-called promiscuous or a passive mode. Now, this in turn means that the device is going to be listening for packets from the network. So we will have to somehow deliver those packets to our device for inspection. And this can be accomplished by using SPAN, remote SPAN a technology, or maybe by using a physical connector, which is going to mirror the traffic flow to our IDS, and known as a vampire tap. Now, in case of SPAN or remote SPAN, we are going to be configuring our switches to copy real packets from one place and then send them to the IDS to, for inspection. So just to quickly show you the concept, let's say that we will configure what is known as a, a span session, which means that we are going to be dealing with a single switch. And this switch is going to be connected to our IDS. Let's say that this is going to be on port F07. And this is also where our clients, or just the traffic that we want to copy, is going to be connected to. So like when we have two devices, host 1 and host 2, both are connected to the same VLAN. Just different interfaces of our switch, like FO3 and let's say FO4. So we might configure this switch to copy the traffic that is received or sent via those interfaces and send it to the IDS for inspection. 
Now, if we had multiple switches, like for example, another switch over here, let's say that this is going to be cat2, this one was cat1, and we have one more, let's say cat3. You could still configure a similar solution, but whenever multiple switches are involved, we are going to be talking about remote span. So in this case, we would have our IDS connected to a different switch from where the traffic we want to copy is flowing. Like for example, our IDS would be connected to switch 3, but we would want to copy the traffic that is going between switches 1 and 2. Maybe we have a different device here, like host 3, and we want to look at communication between host 1 and host 3. So this communication would be going between the switches. So with remote span, you would be able to configure all switches here to copy, send the copy of this communication to a special VLAN known as remote span VLAN. And then on our destination switch, which is where our IDS is connected, we would copy the packets or just send the packets from that VLAN down to the IDS. Okay, the main benefit of promiscuous or just passive mode is that our IDS cannot become a bottleneck in the network. Because once again, the real packets will be unaffected by our sensor. They are kind of like by passing our device because what we send to the device for inspection is just a copy of real communication. Now, in case of the inline deployment, which once again means that our device is going to now act as an IPS solution, we're going to be putting our sensor in line with the real data package. And this can be generally accomplished at layer 2, like when you place an IPS between the switches, or you might also configure your device to route packets between different subnets, which is going to be possible in case of firepower devices. Just a quick example of how your deployment could look like at layer 2 when you deploy inline device. You could configure your switch to track to the sensor, like select one of its interfaces, connect it to the IPS, configure a switch port as a trunk, so this interface, and then we could put our clients, or just the devices that belong to the segment that we want to monitor, in different layer 2 networks. Like we could put our host one in VLAN 10, and we could put a different host from this subnet in VLAN 20. So those devices will be completely unaware of this layer to this connection because once again we're going to put them in a single layer free subnet. They will be in the same subnet. Like for example host 1 is going to be using something, some subnet dot 10, host 2 is going to be using dot 20 in the four pocket from this subnet. So those devices will think that they are directly connected. And then when host 1 for example wants to connect wants to talk to the second host, so it sends a packet with a destination of host 2. It is going to first thing obviously have to ARP for the layer 2 address of host 2, but the packet is going to be sent to the physical address of this second host, and the packet is going to be received by the switch in VLAN 10, which means that the switch is going to send it down the track with a tag number of 10. And now when IPS gets the frame, it is going to first thing inspect it, and if the sensor is okay with the packet, it is going to send it back the same interface, but with a different VLAN number, with a number of 20, which is going to correspond to the VLAN of the second host. And obviously a similar process is going to take place for the opposite direction, so when host replies back to 1, the tag of 20 is going to be replaced with a number of by our IPS after inspecting the, the packet. We obviously, in this case, we assume that the packet is allowed for our sensor. Obviously, the inline mode has a serious advantage over our passive or promiscuous deployment, which is going to be the capability of preventing, not only detecting, but also stopping the attacks. But a problem here is that, well, so the device can actually stop the attack. The traffic must go through, through the sensor in the first place which means that our device could potentially affect the communication 
the traffic flows that are going through it in terms of the bandwidth usage and the delay, maybe latency. So our device could potentially become a bottleneck, like if you didn't plan accordingly for the, the interfaces for the actual platform. There's also a concept of so-called fail close or fail open mode for inline configuration, which is related to the traffic processing when our inspection engine fails. So for example, our IPS was configured in the inline mode and it is forwarding and inspecting the packets as what it should normally do. Now for some reasons our device, our engine inspection engine fails and if we were to configure our device in the fail open mode, it would mean that the sensor would still forward the packets, all packets, good and bad, in both directions. Now if you were to configure it in the fail close mode, it would mean that our device would be blocking all packets, good and back. So fail open versus fail close, once again, it refers to a situation when our inspection engine fails and what do we want to do with the traffic? Do we want to allow it or a block? Our intrusion sensors can be generally divided into network-based or host-based systems, or in case of network-based solutions, we are talking about NIPS, in case of host-based, or just endpoint based systems, we talk about HIPS. And there are going to be some differences between these two types of sensors, so we will now take a look at them. First and foremost, our NIPS can be deployed as a physical appliance, like for example, Fire Power 7 or 8000 a device. It can be deployed as a VMware image, or it can be configured as a module installed on our iOS or maybe ASA, like ASA Firepower inspection module. Now, in case of host-based prevention or just HIPS systems, the way that this is implemented is by installing a software on our endpoints. And in the old days, what we used to do is that we were installing a full-blown IPS IDS software known as an agent on every single endpoint in the network. And those agents, they were taking a lot of CPU cycles, a lot of memory to do the actual inspection. So a better solution, which is commonly used right now, is to use a cloud-based deployment for Edge IPS, which means that what we install on the endpoints is not a full-blown software intrusion detection prevention software, but a lightweight a software that is used to provide connectivity for the endpoint so it can connect to our prevention engine in the cloud. So in this particular case, we kind of like offload the processing from the endpoint uh, to the cloud, and those connectors are only used to provide connectivity uh, from uh, for the endpoint so it can communicate with our engine in the cloud. And there's going to be some advantages of an HIPS. There are going to be some things that our NIPS will not be able to perform. So first and foremost, in case of HIPS sensors, these are capable of analyzing encrypted traffic flows. So this is something that most of the current sensors cannot do when you send an encrypted connection for a network-based um, IPS. Versus on a host, since decryption is going to happen before analysis or just inspection, it means that when analysis engine kicks in, it is going to act on the clear text or just decrypted communication. So this is one benefit over um, NIPS. And then the second one is that HIPS is going to be able to detect attacks that NIPS cannot, which are going to be attacks that don't generate or just require any type of network activity. Like for example, when someone gets physical access to the endpoint and obtains unauthorized access, to the device and modifies or removes certain files. So this obviously couldn't be detected by our NIPS because there is no traffic flowing in the network that is used to modify, provide a session to the endpoint to delete those files versus HIPS is going to be able to detect such as activities. Okay, so lots of good things about HIPS over NIPS, but those systems also have a major drawback comparing to network-based systems, which is generally speaking a burden related to administration. So first and foremost, 
not every single operating system is going to support that host-based system that you might want to use. And even if they do, you will still have to install the actual software on all endpoints. And then you will have to somehow manage this uh, software. Like when you want to access the endpoint or the software remotely, it's going to be a huge problem, a challenging task, how you would actually accomplish that. And now a couple words about the different detection methods that our sensors will be using in their operations. So there is going to be several different solutions that our IDS IPS system will use to detect an attack. And the most common is going to be known as a signature-based detection, where a signature can be simply defined as a file which contains the rules and conditions that describe an offending packet or packets. So signature-based system, most of the current IPSs, IDSs will rely on the signatures, at least up to some extent. And those signatures will have to be downloaded from the vendor because, again, the, the attack detection based on the signatures relies on individual files which contain a description of an attack. So obviously so that the attack can be detected and we will have to download a, a given signature that describes that attack. So generally speaking you will want to keep the signature base up to date all the time and the problem related to that is that if you for some reason don't manage to download the latest signatures your device might not be able to detect one of the newest attacks which was just launched. So generally speaking, this method is also not going to be able to um, detect so-called zero-day threats, which are attacks that has not yet been published. So another thing that we might want to configure on our sensors is known as anomaly detection. And here, instead of relying on signatures, and we're going to add some sort of artificial intelligence to the analysis process. And this is going to be done by, first and foremost, configuring our device to learn the normal activities in our network, like to see what, is a, what are the different regular flows in our network, and kind of like save this information into a profile, make a baseline profile of what normal traffic is in our environment, and then keep using this a profile comparing it to the current activities, looking for anomalies. Another option is going to be to configure a policy statically for a set of rules, where those rules will describe what a normal uh, traffic is. And whenever we see communication, you know, flows that kind of like don't match those rules, we're going to fire up a, a signature. Well, obviously, the problem with this method is that there is going to be huge administrative overhead related to the configuration, and the actual configuration might be quite uh, challenging to make it work for our environment. And then the last method is known as a reputation-based detection, which is when we will rely on an external database, which is going to contain information about the attackers in form of their IP addresses, maybe domain names, URLs. In each of those elements, they will be associated with a certain reputation value. So if a given IP address, URL, or maybe domain name has a really bad reputation, we will be able to block the packets coming from, from this given uh, address or, or just a domain. Okay, so now when we know about the different detection tools that our devices use, now let's think about what our sensor will actually do or just can do when there is an attack going on and this attack was detected. So first and foremost, we will be able to configure our sensor to generate a log message, which is known as alert or alarm, depending on the actual hardware we are dealing with. And this is just a log message so we know exactly that something happened, like what you know signature fired for what addresses. Another thing we might want to do, obviously, is going to be to drop those offending packets and we can drop individual packets or uh, maybe uh, all packets related associated with a given attack. We might be able to block the entire session, like individual conversation or just traffic flow, maybe even all packets between the attacker and the victim. In case of TCP connections, we will be also able to generate a TCP reset packet so our victim stops processing offending packets from the attacker. 
And it is also possible to ask a different device in our network to block communication, like for example with an access list. So this is known as a shun action. There is also a concept of so-called blacklist and whitelist, which is technically not, a, not an action that our device might take. A blacklist and whitelist, uh, these features were created to offload the processing of our um, sensor, like to reduce the overall burden associated with the detection of attacks based on our uh, policies. So signatures, rules, maybe reputation-based uh, policies. And the way it works is that we will configure our a list of bad or good addresses and those addresses will be then used in the initial phase before we start using our policies to detect the attack. So in case of a blacklist specifically, in most cases, well, we will be generally downloading it from an external database. Like for example, in case of Cisco, we will download it from the of Cisco Talos Security Intelligence Database. So Security Intelligence team is constantly updating a list of known sources of malware and malicious activities. We might also want to configure this list manually. It is possible to do it. But if this method is going to be commonly used to build a whitelist, which is going to be when you want to make exceptions as to what traffic you don't want to block by your uh, sensor. And obviously, if the attacker is found on a black or white list, we will either drop or allow packets from the station without having to evaluate our policies. Okay, once our device takes an action for a given packet or a package, this action or just decision of the device can be generally classified as good or bad. And there is a terminology that is associated with describing what the action actually did. First and foremost, when we say that when an event, so the actual action taken by the, the sensor, was true, it means that the action was correct. When we say that the event was classified as false, it means that the action taken by our IDS IPS was wrong. Now, this also obviously means that when the action was classified as incorrect, we should think about tuning or just modifying configuration of our device to avoid similar problems in the future. An event can be also classified as positive or negative. When we say that event was positive, it means that our sensor took an action versus when we say that it was negative, it means that it did nothing. So if you are now to summarize all those different four combinations for true or false, a positive and negative situations, well, first and foremost, we're going to take a look at the events where the action taken by the sensor was correct. So we can describe an event as true positive, which means that the, there was offending traffic that was detected by our sensor, and our sensor took an action. So true means that the action was correct, and positive means that the sensor did something with those packets, like, for example, dropped them. Okay, we can also have an event that is described as true negative, which means that the normal traffic didn't cause our IDS to take an action on it, which is also correct. And we can describe a situation as false in the positive when our sensor took an action for a packet that was not part of an attack. So like if our IDS IPS was trying to stop legitimate traffic flows, which is obviously incorrect action. This is why we describe it as false. And positive means that our sensor acted on those packets, like fired up a signature. And the last option is going to be to say that an event was false negative, which means that there was an attack, but it was not detected by our sensor, which is obviously also an incorrect action. And at the end of this session, I just want to quickly take a look at Cisco's implementation of a next generation sensor, which is known as Firepower. So Firepower is like a regular IDS or IPS because you could deploy it as a detection or prevention system that uses some sophisticated functions and technologies to detect and prevent threats. So the focus of Firepower is going to be threats, not individual signatures.
those threats will be still described by signatures, but there could be multiple signatures that will point to a single threat. And those signatures, we will download them from the Cisco Talos Security Intelligence Database. Now, whenever you deploy Firepower IPS, you will also have to configure a so-called Fireside Management Center, which is a single platform used to manage our Firepower physical devices, virtual software images, and even the ASA for the purposes of collecting and aggregating this information in one place in our network. And Fireside Management Center can be deployed either as a virtual software image on a VMware server or as one of the physical appliances. At this time, I'd like to talk about email security and email security appliance. Since most of the current and modern organizations rely on emails as one of the communications channels, and because of the fact that it's pretty easy to generate or just craft an email to an arbitrary recipient, this technology is commonly used as an attack vector to deliver certain information to our employees or to infect some of our internal devices. Generally speaking, there are two main groups of email-based attacks. One of these attacks is known as spam, which is sending a large number of unsolicited or just unwanted messages, collectively known as the junk, to advertise a, a certain information or just to deliver a certain information to as many destinations as possible. So those messages in most cases will be just irritating. They will probably take some time of our employees to go for them they may take some storage and bandwidth of our network, but in most cases they will not contain any malicious attachments. And this is as opposed to the malicious emails, which are generally messages targeted at a specific audience, like for example a single organization or maybe individual employees of that organization. And here those attacks can be divided into so-called embedded attachments, or a direct attacks. With embedded attachments, this is when someone includes a piece of a software in a form of an attachment, like a virus or Trojan, maybe a worm, where the goal is gonna to be to infect our employee's PC, and in most cases also to propagate to other internal devices. Then with direct attacks, the goal is gonna to be to obtain some sort of confidential information. And in case of those direct attacks, the way that they are implemented is by using what is known as phishing, which is a process of acting as a trusted party in a communication channel in order to obtain some sort of sensitive data. Like for example, personally identifiable information, maybe credit card data, maybe social security number, or maybe just some sort of intellectual property. And in most cases, phishing simply refers to the fake websites when someone is sending us an email with a link, like for example, a link to our bank website, well actually a website that appears as our real bank's website, so we can provide our passport and possibly some other information that the attacker needs to get to our real bank account. So this website is going to look very similar or even is going to be identical to our real a bank's website, and this is the main reason why those attacks are such dangerous. There is also a few different subgroups of phishing attacks, like for example Wailing, which is targeted at senior executives of a company, or Vishing, which is when someone is communicating with our target over a phone. Now once we discuss the different threats that can use email as a communication medium, now let's talk about a solution that we can deploy in our network to protect our email traffic. And what I want to focus on in this session is one of the Cisco's technologies, one of the Cisco's appliances known as an email security appliance. So email security appliance or ESA is generally designed to perform two main functions. One is going to be to protect our network from email-based threats like spam or malicious emails. And the other application of ESA is going to be to control uh, email communication in general, so it's going to be used to enforce a certain policy on our email traffic, like incoming and outgoing. In terms of the security options for 
uh, for the ESA or just the options available on the ESA, well, first and foremost, we will be able to control emails based on the reputation of the sender. Like, for example, when we get an email message from xyz.com, someone at xyz.com, uh, we will take a look at the reputation of the server that sent or just delivered the message. And if the server has a really bad reputation, it could potentially mean that this is just a, another spam message and we will drop that message without inspecting it with other features. There is also what is known as outbreak filtering, which is a method that allows us to quarantine emails that are likely to contain new viruses. And we will be also able to use advanced malware protection, AMP, which is an anti-malware solution that, generally speaking, does not rely on signatures in attack or just malware detection. It relies on the uh, Cisco's uh, databases, uh, Talos um, Security Intelligence Operations databases uh, for real-time analysis and inspection of the files traversing our network. And then for the policy, what we will be able to do is going to be to, well, first and foremost, control incoming emails so email traffic sent to our company. So we will be able to cut down on the spam centers and we will be able to enforce a certain limit like in a number of emails that we want to accept and allow to enter our company. Then for outgoing communication, like here we will be able to ensure that we are accepting the right messages and then the messages we will accept from our internal users that they will be sent reliably and in a high performance fashion. For outgoing email communication, we will be also able to control the actual content of the messages. I'm thinking about what is known as data loss prevention feature, which is the ability to drop emails that contain personally identifiable information, like credit card data or social security numbers. Or if we don't really want to drop those messages, we want to allow them to go out, then we will will be able to enforce encryption using this uh, solution. And finally, it is also possible to inspect the content of our messages, incoming and uh, outgoing emails, like looking at the individual fields from the header, maybe recipients, maybe sender, like looking at the body of the message, including the attachments. There are three main ways to deploy our ESA in the network. First and foremost, we can deploy a physical ESA. It could be one of the C or X series devices. We could configure it in our network and specifically the recommended design is going to be to place that ESA into our DMZ segment. And it can be done using a single interface or maybe two interfaces of that security appliance. So what is going to be the difference between these two modes? Okay, so I'm going to assume that this is going to be our ASA firewall, which is connected to the inside network and then to the DMZ and obviously to the outside, where outside is connected to our internet. We're going to put our ESA into the DMZ using either a single interface. This is going to be our first option. Or we could also take a look at a similar topology. But in this second case, we're going to be using two interfaces. One is still going to be connected to the DMZ of the ASA, but the other one is going to be connected to the inside network, like to a um, distribution layer switch. And the goal is going to be to allow the second interface to communicate with our internal SMTP server, like, for example, an exchange server. And now the difference between these two designs is that in our the first case, this single interface of the ESA is used to handle both incoming emails, which is traffic from the internet, and also outgoing emails, which is traffic from our clients when the ESA sends it outbound to the internet. And then in the second case, this single interface of the DMZ is used for incoming communication, incoming emails, so traffic from the internet, and then the second interface is used for the traffic coming from our internal server, which is going to be emails sent by our users. Two other ways to deploy ESA in the network 
that we can either use a virtual appliance ESAV or we can go for a hybrid solution which would mean that we would be using cloud-based inspection for incoming emails so incoming emails would be sent to the cloud and then for outgoing traffic we would be inspecting those emails using an on-premise solution like for example it would be physical ESA and at the end of this session I want to quickly take a look at a process of exchanging emails I want to talk about how emails are forwarded so if you think about how a regular IP packet is forwarded we know that this forwarding happens based on a destination IP address from the packet and with email forwarding the process is going to be slightly similar but obviously we are not going to be using an IP address because there is no such as information in the email message itself what we're going to be using instead is going to be a recipient's address and specifically the domain name of a portion of that address so in simple words we can say that emails are forwarded based on the destination the domain and the way that this is done is by performing a DNS lookup and mail exchange a max lookup on this destination domain to learn the name of the email server that handles or is responsible for this destination domain so assuming that we will get a reply from the DNS server we will then perform another DNS lookup but this time for an address trying to figure out what is the destination IP address associated with the name of our SMTP destination server now in certain cases we will actually not get a reply for the MX request and in such cases we will perform an A lookup on the destination domain name itself but the goal is going to be to obtain an IP address of a server which is where we will be sending our emails to so let's now take a look at the process and we will look at the and we will take a look at that from the perspective of receiving email messages and from a perspective of sending messages when someone in our organization is sending emails to the outside world right so maybe let's start with incoming emails and maybe first thing let me draw up a simple topology that we will be using to illustrate this communication so we will say that our organization and we're going to have an ESA connected to the ASA to the DMZ and this ESA is also going to be connected to our internal network to communicate with our internal SNTP server and let's say that our organization uses the following domain name we're going to use valverdi.com so this is our domain and the goal here what I want to show you here is going to be how people will be sending emails to us to our network okay so let's say that we have an edge router which is connected to the internet and this is also where a public DNS server resides okay and then one more thing that we will need here is going to be an SNTP server which is going to handle the messages from our user from our client so let's say that someone on this PC1 wants to send an email with a destination with the recipient's address of let's say Kate at our domain so at valverde.com So obviously the user's PC is configured with some sort of a email software and this software knows what is the address of an SMTP server which is going to handle the outgoing emails. So this email is sent to this SMTP server and SMTP server is now looking at the destination portion of that recipient's address which is the domain name and it is sending a, a max DNS request asking for a name of the SNTP server that handles or basically is responsible for our valverd.com so the DNS server is going to either reply with the name like for example SNTP.valverde.com or if, if it wasn't configured with an MX record it is going to cause the client to generate a 
another request, but this time asking for an API address of the domain name itself. So in this first case, assuming that we have configured an, a max record, like as I said, we could basically configure something with, with a name similar to smtp.valverdi.com. This could be a name of our ESA, DNS name. So if this information was returned to the, to the client's SMTP server, the A lookup would be performed on this name instead of on the domain name. But the key thing is going to be that our client's SMTP server is going to learn about the IP address of our ESA. So this name here is supposed to correspond to the ESA. And this way, this message is going to be then delivered to our ESA in the DMZ. ESA is going to inspect the message. And assuming that everything is OK with the content, and that the sending SMTP server is not a known source of spam, it is going to send for this message down to our internal email server, like for example, Exchange, so that our user, which in this case is Kate, can download that message using either POP3 or IMAP. So SMTP is not is not used for downloading emails. SMTP is used just for email forwarding. Okay, so we'll take a look at what's how to process incoming emails, which is emails coming from the outside to our organization. In this case, we're going to take a look at outgoing email communication, which is when we, one of our users, wants to send an email to an external destination. So we will say that our internal PC, PC1, which is connected to the internal LAN, which is then connected to our internal SMTP server, and then the inside of the ASA. The ASA is going to be connected to the ESA, pretty much the same topology as in the previous case. And then this interface, second interface of the ESA, it gets connected to SMTP internal server. We have an edge router, then the internet, and a public DNS, and also SMTP server of our destination client, which in this case is going to be xyz.com. So when our user, let's say Kate, when she wants to send an email to John at xyz.com. So John is essentially one of the email accounts at this xyz.com domain. This message is going to be sent to the internal SMTP server for evaluation. And now there are going to be two different things that may happen. If this email was sent to a local account, like someone from our valverde.com domain, SMTP server would handle this message on its own. And the second possibility, which is our case, is when a destination is non-local. So xyz.com is obviously not valverde.com. And because of that, our internal SMTP server is going to forward this message to the ESA. So ESA is now going to do the inspection. And if everything is fine with that message, it is going to perform a lookup, a max lookup on the destination domain. So it is going to send a packet to the DNS server. The server is supposed to reply either with the actual name like smtp.xyz.com or if it replies with no information, the ESA is going to perform the A lookup on the destination domain. But in our case, we assume that it returns smtp.xyz.com. So ESA is going to perform the a lookup on this MX record. So obviously the end result of this communication is that we will now obtain an IP address of this destination SMTP server, which is this one here. And the email is going to be sent to this server. And now someone from this XYZ.com, it must be John. So let's say that John uses PC2 
will be now able to download this email using POP3 or IMAP. So a very, very similar process to the previous example. The, the main difference is that our internal SMTP server is used to distinguish between local and non-local emails. Another topic I'd like to discuss is the two different implementations of a web security solution from Cisco. I'd like to discuss so-called WSA, or just web security appliance, along with a very similar implementation of the proxy, which is going to be based in the cloud. The WSA is a combination of a fast proxy a service, along with an advanced content filtering capabilities. This device is designed specifically to control and inspect web communication, which is going to be HTTP and HTTPS traffic. It is also possible to use WSA to inspect and enforce our policy on FTP connections. And same as with the ESA, the two main purposes of the WSA is going to be to control uh, our web communication in general, like inbound album connections. And then the second application is going to be to protect our network against certain threats. In this case, threats that can be delivered over a web connections. So strong caching policy enforcement capabilities along with anti-malware. And this is what WSA is going to offer uh, to our network. Now, WSA is not a, a single technology. And as we will see, there are going to be multiple different features that we will enable to build, configure our policies. It's essentially a combination of different technologies which are known as security components. And some of those components will work independently from each other. Some others will work in tandem. So let's now quickly take a look at the different features of the proxy, the different individual components, and let's just briefly describe what is their role. If you're following this as the primary tool that we will be deploying in our network to build our policy. It gives us the ability to control a web transaction based on the destination URL or just URL from the web request packet. Like for example, we might be able to block web packets destined to gambling websites and maybe allow packets destined to social media sites. And this is generally going to be achieved by configuring our policy based on so-called URL categories, where a category is just a group of websites that offer a similar content. It is possible to build our policy based on individual URLs or maybe domain names, but obviously this is not going to be a scalable solution. And given the amount of web pages we have out there on the internet, it would be way too much a time-consuming task if we were to build our policy based on individual URLs. So WSA is going to come with a lot of predefined categories, like, for example, news, the social media, the gambling, and we will be building our policy based on that information. Another thing that we might want to enable on the WSA is known as Application Visibility and Control, or just AVC, which is the ability to inspect our packets, including the, the payload of the packets. So not just the application layer headers, but also a payload of the package for the purposes of being able to distinguish between individual applications being used within a given session or just a transaction. Like, for example, I might want to block communication to Facebook, but maybe allow Twitter or maybe do something similar, but I don't want to block all the web package. And then for certain individual applications, we might be also able to tell what micro-application or the sub-application is being used, is being accessed by the user. Just an example is when someone is uploading a photo for its Facebook account versus when that person is playing uh, games using Facebook. So you will be able to distinguish between those uh, sub-applications, micro-applications in, in certain cases as well. We have three antivirus engines available on the WSA for configuration, Sophos, McAfee, and Webroot. Those engines will be able to scan our transactions looking for different types of malware. 
So you might want to enable one of these engines, maybe two of them, maybe all of them at once. And they will be able to scan certain transactions based on your configuration. There is also a feature which is called Layer for Traffic Monitor that works more of like an IDS solution. The main role of L4TM is to inspect packets going over different ports than regular HTTP. And by default, the proxy is going to inspect web packets coming over TCP port 80 and 3128. So if you want to inspect packets using different ports, different TCP ports, you might want to deploy this feature. And WSA is also capable of decrypting SSL TLS protected web sessions for the purposes of inspecting the content of the uh, transactions. So as we know, encryption is sometimes used to bypass our security inspections. And with this uh, decryption option for HTTPS, we might simply tell our WSA that certain communication should be always decrypted, or we might want to make a decision to whether to decrypt or not in a dynamic way based on so-called reputation score associated with a given a website. And this way we will be able to see the exact content or just the information exchange within the session. There are two main ways how we can deploy WSA in our network. We can deploy our WSA in the web proxy mode, which is the most common implementation. And we can also potentially enable this layer for traffic monitor feature, which, which once again acts more of like an IDS for TCP uh, traffic. And now web proxy mode can be deployed either in the explicit forward or transparent mode. When you configure explicit forward mode, it means that some configuration is going to be needed on the endpoints, specifically on the client device's browser. You will have to tell the browser what is the IP address of your proxy. So this can be done manually or maybe using some sort of a, a proxy auto configuration file, like a pack file, that could be then distributed with your policy. But this information must be sent to the browser so it knows what device is supposed to inspect web communication. And the benefit of this method is that you could put your WSA pretty much anywhere in the network. As long as the client stations know how to get to the proxy, you will be fine with, with placing WSA in an arbitrary point in the network. And then we got that transparent mode, which is different from explicit forward in a way that it doesn't require any type of reconfiguration on the client stations. So whenever you deploy a transparent WSA, you will not have to configure a browser of your client devices, which means that this deployment, this type of WSA deployment is going to be, as the name implies, completely transparent to the end users, at least initially. No configuration needed on the, on the client devices, but you will have to configure at least one or more of your network devices because someone must still redirect web communication to the proxy for inspection. And in this particular case, it is going to be done by using a so-called web cache communication protocol WCCP version 2. One of our network devices it could be an iOS router, could be an ASA firewall, could be a layer 4 switch, it will be configured for WCCP. Our proxy is also going to be configured for WCCP. And this is how our uh, traffic is going to be redirected to the WSA. WCCP is going to capture or just redirect all web packets or just the communication that we want to redirect. And it is going to send it to the proxy for inspection. Now here, it's not going to be that easy to deploy a WSA in an existing infrastructure. I'm talking about the place where you can put your WSA. It can be an arbitrary location. If you want to deploy WSA along with an ASA firewall, which is going to be doing the redirection, you always have to put the proxy on the inside interface of the ASA. And in most valid designs, you will be actually deploying your WSA in the Internet Edge in the distribution layer. So let's quickly go over these two modes. I want to show you how the traffic is going to be 
flowing in one mode versus another. I'm going to say that our PC1 is going to act is going to act as one of the client devices. And this device is going to be connected into an internal network. It's going to be an example of the explicit affording what I want to show you first. So once again, in this case, the location of the proxy doesn't really matter. I'm going to put it somewhere here. Let's say that WSA is connected to the internal network. And then you'll also add our ASA, which is connected to an edge router. And then our router goes to the internet. And let's say that our user, which is connected to PC1, is going to be trying to get the website. It's going to be www.cisco.com. So pretty straightforward topology. And let's now think about how the communication is going to be a web communication is going to be established in this environment when we enable that explicit forwarding, which means that our uh, client browser device is going to be reconfigured with an IP address of the WSA. So in this uh, particular mode, whenever the user enters a URL in the URL bar of the browser, the browser is going to blindly generate a request packet and send it with the destination IP address of our WSA. So the packet is going to be sourced from PC1, and it is going to be destined to the proxy. Now the proxy is going to do the inspection, and assuming that everything is fine with the packet, it is going to redirect the packet to the final destination. It is going to change the source address in the packet. So we can say that WSA is going to be performing some sort of a network address translation on the web the package. And the reason that it is doing this, it is going to change the source IP address to itself, is so when our destination server replies back, it is going to reply to what destination? It is going to reply to the WSA. Because WSA changed the original source address in the packet that now points to the proxy. So the reply is also going to be destined to the WSA and this is needed so our proxy can inspect both directions of the flow of the session. The traffic from the client to the server, which is going to be our request. But we definitely also want to take a look at the replies, which is going to be the content of our web page. And WSA is going to then, assuming that the packet is OK, it is going to kind of like detranslate this address. And it is going to send the reply back to the originating client. So based on the fact that our PC is configured with an IP address of the WSA, as long as our client has reachability to the proxy, we can put our proxy pretty much anywhere in the uh, network in this explicit forwarding mode. Okay, one additional thing I want to mention here for this example is that in many cases what you will also configure on your firewall is going to be a policy for the inside internal interface, which is only going to permit web communication originated by your proxy. This is to ensure that if someone is trying to bypass the WSA by sending web packets directly to the internet, this communication is going to be blocked by the ASA. Well, obviously, we don't really want people to be able to reach internet directly by passing our proxy, because it would mean that those sessions will not be inspected. So on the ASA you would build an access list where you will say that you want to permit TCP packets from the WSA to anyone. And this is going to be port 80 obviously or any other port that you want to use WSA for. And then you will say that you want to deny all other web communication. And the last entry, assuming that you want to allow all other packets, you will say permit IP any any at the end. So just an example how this access list on the inside of the ASA could look like. 
Okay, so what is going to change when we now deploy our WSA in the transparent mode? So we will have a similar topology to our previous example. Our PC is going to be sending web packets to, um, to a server connected on the, on the internet. Let's say that we have a local area network over here. This is connected to a distribution layer switch. This is where we will put our WSA and also the inside of the ASA. The okay, outside goes to an edge router, which is connected to the internet. And this is our web server over here, cisco.com. So almost the same topology as in the previous example. Okay, the question is what is going to be different now? Okay, so here, once the user types in the URL, which is where it wants to get to, an address of a website, in the browser's URL bar, it is going to force the browser, specifically the browser's DNS resolver, to generate a name resolution request to figure out what is the IP address of, in this particular case, cisco.com, so it knows how to build, so the device knows how to build a web pack. So for simplicity, let's say that the, the cisco.com, the IP address that corresponds to this website, is simply www. So from the PC1's perspective, once the packet is generated, the packet is going to be sourced from the PC. Source is going to be PC1. And packet is going to be destined to our web server which means that the packet is going to be generally routed to the inside interface of the ASA because ASA is obviously in that path between the clients and the internet. But the key thing which is going to be different from the previous example is that our inside interface of the firewall is going to be configured for web cache communication protocol version 2 which is going to cause the ASA to redirect that packet to the WSA for inspection. And WSA is going to then do the same thing as in the previous case. Assuming that the packet is allowed, it is going to change a source address of the packet pointing to itself. So a new source is going to be WSA. It is going to send that packet to the destination server. The server is going to reply back to the proxy. And then after inspecting the response, proxy is going to send the reply back to the originating client PC1. So in this mode, deployment mode for the proxy, it's going to be once again one of our network devices, in our case it's the ASA, which is going to be responsible for doing redirection of the web packets. And now what the traffic we want to redirect to the WSA, it's going to be a part of our configuration, of our proxy configuration, and this information is going to be communicated to our ASA, in this case, using web cache communication, a protocol version 2. One additional mode that you could also deploy a proxy in is a layer for traffic monitor, which is the TCP-based IDS-like solution. This mode of deployment requires the traffic to be redirected to the proxy, actually like with all other um, deployments. But here, the way that we will do the redirection is going to be different. We will not be configuring our client devices, and we will not be configuring our layer 3 or layer 4 network devices. We will probably use a span or remote span, which is going to be a configuration done on our switches to tell the switches what traffic we want to copy to the WSA's L4TM interface. Or we could also use a network tab, like a vampire tab, which is a physical connector that mirrors traffic from one place to another. So once again, layer 4 traffic monitor, this solution works for TCP uh, packets only, and it is used to inspect, uh, look for malware on packets destined to ports other than um, 80, and possibly this other default port, which is 3128. And as I said at the beginning of this session, there is also a different solution that we can implement to protect our web communication. And this one is known as Cloud Web Security, 
which is an example of a software as a service implementation of the proxy service. So software as a service architecture is like when you will rely on a third party provider to deliver a certain service. What the advantage of that is that you will not have to worry about any type of hardware and software along with the overall maintenance and upkeep of that service because it's going to be the job of that a third party a provider. So you will just have to pay a fee like on a monthly basis to be able to use a given service. And in our particular case with CWS, it's going to be obviously that web inspection will be will, will be will be buying. So the overall implementation of CWS in terms of functionality is going to be very similar to the uh, physical or just virtual WSA, except that FTP a protocol is not going to be supported. Same as with the WSA, we will have to somehow redirect the traffic to the CWS proxy or proxies for inspection. And this can be done using either the explicit fourth solution, like in the previous case. Here we'll just have to know the addresses of the cloud-based proxies. But this information is going to be provided to you by Cisco. Or we can use what is known as a cloud connector which is when you will integrate a special piece of software with our network devices, like an iOS router, generation 2 router, uh, like an ASA firewall, or maybe physical WSA, if you want to offload the processing from the physical devices to the cloud. And we're going to install this connector on those uh, platforms. This way, integrate those platforms with our cloud web proxies meaning that it's going to be the role of a connector to do the redirection of the traffic from the network to the cloud. So this one is similar to the transparent mode of the WSA, with the exception that we are not going to be doing this redirection to a physical or virtual on-premise unit, and we will be redirecting those packets to the, the cloud. And it is even possible to configure any connect client, deploy it along with CWS, and this is going to work by using a split tunneling approach to the, the traffic forwarding. So once you connect from your laptop or maybe a smartphone to your internal headquarters, all internet-based traffic is going to be is going to be sent directly to the CWS proxies for inspection, versus everything else is going to be tunneled to your the central VPN server. In our next session, we're going to take a look at different endpoint security solutions. An endpoint which is going to be one of the client devices, such as PC, laptop, notebook, maybe mobile phone, is always going to be a critical component of every single organization. And this is primarily because of the fact that endpoints, in many cases, contain some sort of highly sensitive or important information which we obviously want to protect. So there's going to be a few main solutions that we will be deploying on the endpoints to protect that kind of information. First and foremost, we will be relying on antivirus or anti-malware, which is a broader term, a software which is supposed to protect our devices from known and in certain cases also unknown malware programs. And we will be relying on personal firewalls to block communications, remote communications coming from untrusted sources. We might deploy one of the newer Cisco security solutions for endpoints known as advanced malware protection, which generally speaking does not rely on signatures in malware detection. We might want to deploy encryption to make our data unreadable to third parties. And finally, we can also configure a host-based intrusion prevention system on our endpoint. We talked about that type of solution in one of the previous sessions, so we will not be covering it here. I would like to start our discussion on endpoint security by describing different types of malware and also briefly going over the main function of an antivirus software. So malware can be generally defined as an umbrella. This is an umbrella term that describes many different types of programs and applications 
that we really want to have them installed on our APCs. So any type of unwanted software that is typically installed without our knowledge or permission is classified as malware. Now, some people in the industry, they will kind of like further subdivide this classification and they will distinguish non-malicious applications or programs from malicious software. So they will separate adware, maybe spyware applications from malware. But in our case, we will not be doing that. Every single application that we really want to have it installed on our PC, I'm going to simply call it a malware. And the reason for this is that many applications written these days are created for multiple different purposes. So a given application might be performing a non-malicious activity, like for example, tracking your activities, but in the same time, it might be able to read your keystrokes or maybe credit card information and send it to someone on the internet, which is definitely a malicious activity. So because of the fact that the line between a non-malicious and malicious program is sometimes blurry, we will simply classify all those unwanted programs into a single group of applications known as malware. And this is also what, what most people in the industry actually does at these times. Now, the primary mitigation tool that we will be deploying on the endpoints to protect those devices from malware or if our devices got infected to detect this unwanted software and hopefully remove it is going to be an antivirus software. Now, these days, antivirus is actually commonly referred to as anti-malware because there is much more than just viruses, what is classified as part of the large group of unwanted applications. Antivirus software can be also known as anti-malware because of the fact that there is just much more than viruses what can affect, infect our PCs in general. Back in the days, like 20, 25 years ago, the only type of malicious software we had to deal with was known as viruses. But these days, there is much more than viruses, and this is why the term antivirus becomes um, somewhat obsolete. Those applications programs that we install on our PCs to protect them against malware are now commonly known as anti-malware software. Okay, let's now briefly look at the different subcategories of malware, a group of applications. And I'd like to start this discussion with so-called adware, which is a program that was created to display certain advertisements. And the reason why this advertisement was created is obviously to generate a revenue for its a creator. Okay, another group of unwanted applications that can be classified as part of malware group is known as spyware, which is a program that was written to track our activities. Like for example, browsing habits, or maybe the different applications that we have installed on our endpoints. And for the purposes of collecting this information, in many cases, passing it on to the marketers. So using this, processing this information and using for um, other purposes. In many cases, that type of programs, the same as AdWare, will act as a non-malicious software, but some more sophisticated spyware programs, they will be able to, for example, steal our credit card information or a lot just collect our keystrokes. So that will be obviously an example of a malicious activity. Next, we have an application that is known as ransomware, which was created or just written to lock a certain functionality of our PC like maybe make certain files unavailable, log the entire system. And the reason why this application is doing that is to demand money to be paid like a ransom to unlock this a certain functionality. And in most cases, the way that ransomware programs operate is by encrypting certain files. So once a ransom got installed on your PC, some of your files might get encrypted. You will no longer be able to read them and the program is going to display a window asking you to pay a certain amount of money, send it to the attacker to get the correct key to decrypt the files. Next, we have our viruses, which is the oldest type of malicious software. The key thing to know about viruses is that they remain inactive 
until we activate them by executing an infected file. Now, once the file, infected file, gets executed, the virus is going to perform two different things. First and foremost, it will try to replicate itself, like the different file on a local hard drive, maybe to a non-local file, like when you connected an external USB drive, or maybe for the network, like for an email. It's going to try to replicate to infect other files on other systems. And then it is going to, in many cases, do a certain harm on the infected station, like delete a file, maybe a bunch of files, maybe show a black screen, reboot a PC, a degradate performance, and a variety of other things. In general, there is going to be a few different types of viruses. The most viruses is going to act, is going to infect individual applications or programs but some other viruses might also infect your boot sector of the hard drive, for example, and this way load themselves into the memory every time you boot your PC. Another thing we have on the list is a worm, which can be described as a self-replicating virus. So in case of worms, they don't require any type of activation. They don't need to be executed. They will be propagating automatically in most cases using a network as the communication uh, channel. This replication is going to rely on certain vulnerabilities found in the operating systems or maybe in uh, applications, but remember that a work doesn't need to be activated to replicate. Next is a Trojan, which can be described as a non-replicating malicious software that acts or just pretends to be a different legitimate application. So Trojans don't replicate themselves and they are commonly used to provide a backer to our system like to allow attackers to remotely control our infected station for the purposes of sending, receiving, launching, deleting the files, maybe changing files on our PC, rebooting the PC or maybe making it part of a, a so-called botnet where the purpose is to use our machine in a coordinated, distributed denial-of-service attack. Most of the modern antivirus, anti-malware solutions rely on different methods in detecting malware. First and foremost, they will use a signature-based detection, which has two major drawbacks. First and foremost, if you don't keep your signatures updated, you will not always be able to detect all known attacks. And second drawback is that this solution is not able to detect attacks that have not yet been published. So attacks which are not yet known to the security community. Like if someone discovers a new vulnerability, it doesn't publish it, and then writes a code that will then exploit this vulnerability. So obviously there is going to be no signature for such an attack, and the signature-based detection will always fail. And this is the primary reason why there are going to be some other uh, tools that our software is going to use when detecting malware. Like, for example, heuristics, which is when we will put the code that we analyze into a special isolated space in the memory of the PC, known as a sandbox, execute that file, and then see how it behaves. So there is no chance for this malware to leak out of that sandbox we can safely execute this file in the sandbox and then look for anomalies. And this is somewhat similar to our next solution known as behavioral analysis, which is when you will still allow the code to be executed, but not in a special isolated memory sandbox. We will just allow the application, the analyzed code, to be executed normally on, the, on our endpoint, but we will be observing this application, kind of like monitoring it, looking for any signs of malicious activity. Like, for example, if this application is trying to launch a different process, maybe kill a process, or maybe delete certain files. So obviously, when we see that the application, or just the code that we analyze, starts behaving abnormally, we will be able to block or quarantine the process. So this method, same as heuristics, is capable of detecting some of the zero-day attacks. 
Now, no matter what type of antivirus or anti-malware software you're using, the most important thing is always going to be to keep the software up to date. Another thing we have on the list is a personal firewall, which is different from traditional firewalls that divide our network into logical zones to enforce our policy in a way that a personal firewall is only capable of protecting a single endpoint, the endpoint on which it was installed. So with traditional firewalls, we know that they are capable of protecting multiple devices, generally speaking devices configured, connected to a single zone by enforcing a inner zone a policy, like allowing certain applications blocking others. In case of a personal firewall, once again, this one gets installed on a single device, so it's only capable of protecting this single endpoint. And it's going to be pretty easy to enable and use this type of protection tool because it is integrated with most of the current operating systems. Like in case of Windows systems, it is known as the Windows Firewall. In case of Linux, it is known as IP tables. So pretty, uh, pretty easy to use and configure. And this type of protection tool is going to be especially important for mobile devices. Obviously, when your laptop, your corporate laptop, is being used from your organization, from the internal network, your device is automatically protected by the traditional firewall. But when you take this laptop, move it out of the organization, take it to the hotel, maybe coffee shop, an airport, those locations in most cases will not have any type of firewall deployed, which opens your endpoint vulnerable to certain attacks. So this is going to be critical to ensure that your personal firewall is active in those non-trusted locations. And then the second case where a personal firewall is going to be critical to be enabled, to be used, is when your users are connecting to your internal network through a, a VPN tunnel. And specifically, it's going to be critical to deploy a personal firewall when split tunneling for a dead VPN connection is enabled, which means that part of your client communication goes in clear to the internet which means that some traffic bypasses the VPN tunnel. And the problem with this approach is that obviously if you are able to reach some resources on the internet, someone from the internet could potentially reach your PC in clear also bypassing the VPN tunnel. So what is going to be a potential a problem with that kind of a setup? Let's say that our PC, which is connected to the internet, builds a VPN tunnel with our internal VPN gateway, which is connected to our corporate network, like a corporate LAN. So we build a VPN tunnel from the PC to the gateway. This is our VPN, and the communication within that VPN is obviously encrypted and integrity protected. So some data is going to be destined through the tunnel to the internal network. But with split tunneling enabled, we will also in the same time allow our PC, our user, to access some resources available on the internet in clear. Like if we have a web server that this user wants to access when being connected for that VPN. So the problem with this setup is that if someone is able to access our PC remotely, from the internet. Maybe this PC was infected with a Trojan, which is now acting as a backdoor. So this would mean that the attacker could reach this backdoor application over the internet. And then assuming that the VPN tunnel is still up, it could also reach our internal network for this secure VPN connection. So this whole setup here obviously results in a situation that certain remote attackers might treat, might use our PC as a jump box to the internal network. One of the newer solutions that we can deploy on our endpoints to protect them against different type of malware is known as advanced malware protection or just AMP. This method, this technology, generally speaking, does not rely on the signatures. And this is its first advantage. 
And the second advantage is that it provides the analysis, the inspection of the traffic and files in a continuous way. So with AMP, your devices will not be protected, will not only be protected before and during the attack, but also after. For example, when certain files were initially allowed into the network, but then it turned out that those files are actually malicious, then AMP is going to be able to detect that type of situation and, and block or uh, quarantine those files. Okay, so the behavior of AMP can be divided, logically divided into three phases. Phase number one is when AMP will be protecting our endpoints before a potential harm is actually done. And this is performed using file reputation, which is where the signature, just the fingerprint of our file, uh, or the file which is being analyzed, is being sent to the security intelligence operations cloud for analysis. And based on the reputation of that file, we will be able to tell if it is a legitimate, non-malicious file, or maybe it has a bad reputation, we want to drop it. It is possible that certain files will not be part of the database. They will not be known to the SIO intelligence, which would potentially mean that such a file could harm our PC, because we don't really know it at the moment. So what we will do in that situation is that we will still analyze that file, but we will do it in a sandbox environment. So somewhat similar approach to heuristic based detection that is commonly used by antivirus software. In the protection after attack, our third phase is going to rely on file retrospection, which is the ability of tracking files that were allowed into the network, still analyzing them. So it's like a continuous analysis of everything that was allowed into the network, uh, looking for anomalies. There are three different ways how we can deploy advanced malware protection in the network. We can integrate this solution with our network devices, like for example with ASA with firepower services, with ISR routers, maybe email or web security appliances. We can deploy it directly on the endpoints using so-called connectors. So a connector is going to act as a software which is going to communicate with the cloud, or basically is going to communicate our endpoint with the cloud, I should say. And this is going to work for Windows, Mac, Linux, and mobile devices. Or we could also deploy what is known as an advanced model protection private cloud. So in these two previous solutions, we will be generally contacting the public the cloud maintained by Cisco when we do that, this whole uh, free stage analysis. In case of the private cloud, we will kind of like deploy our own cloud on premises, where the main benefit is that our private or just internal information data will not be sent anywhere outside of our organization. The entire analysis is going to be performed locally in this private cloud. Last but not the least, it is also possible to encrypt certain files on our endpoints. It is even possible to encrypt entire hard drives, which is going to be especially important for mobile devices that could be potentially lost or stolen. The most important thing to remember when you deploy encryption is that your private key or just your passphrase should be protected and archived. Because if you lose access or just forget about the key that you use for encryption, you will not be able to decrypt the data and this way lose your valuable information. The encryption can be performed either in software or hardware. Some of the modern operating systems, like for example, Mac OS X, they even provide built-in encryption utilities. But just in case if you are not a Mac user, you will be still able to deploy this software or hardware encryption by using third-party applications or solutions, like for example BitLocker or maybe in case of hardware solution using an external USB drive. And the main difference between software and hardware encryption is going to be in performance. When you deploy software-based encryption, it could potentially slow down your PC or in other words could somehow affect the overall performance of your endpoint versus when you use uh, hardware encryption, 
the endpoint performance will remain unaffected. In our next session, we're going to briefly discuss ADU2.1x authentication. IEEE ADU2.1x is a layer to authentication mechanism that we can enable on wired or wireless LANs to control who will be able to connect to our network. If you think about what happens without having this technology in place, well, essentially everyone who can access our switch or who can see a SSID in case of wireless networks, assuming that authentication was not enabled for a given wireless LAN, is going to be able to connect to the network. So on the switch side, we just have to make sure that the link status of the switch interface goes up. So we have the link connectivity. Then we will have to configure an IP address on our client. And this way, we should be able to reach at least the directly connected devices on a given LAN. So with that one x authentication, what is going to change here is that we will be blocking access to the network. And only until, only when we successfully authenticate, we will allow a, a client to connect. So based on the original specification of that one x the, the protocol once enabled only allows EAP over LAN packets. You can think of those as simple that one x packets for a given switch or to our access point in case of wireless networks. And all other communication is blocked. So we will have to first thing authenticate. If authentication is successful, we will be given access to the network. Now, in case of the, the Cisco's implementation, of the dot one x standard, there are actually some other exceptions made on the switch ports in terms of what traffic will be allowed for the port before authentication. So we will be also allowing spanning free packets and optionally CDP or LLDP, like if a switch was told that it's going to be an IP phone, what will be connecting to a given switch port. Because our IP phone needs to negotiate needs to exchange information with the switch about the power requirements and about a voice VLAN it should join. Okay, so if over LAN, as I said, you can think of those frames as of regular dot one x packets that are used to negotiate our authentication or just that are used during the authentication negotiation. But specifically, EAP stands for Extensible Authentication Protocol. And it is a, an open framework that allows us to exchange an arbitrary authentication data. And more specifically, it also allows to exchange the actual authentication information. So when you use EAP, you will be able to negotiate an authentication method and then do the actual authentication. A2.1x authentication is not just a pure authentication solution. It is also used to enforce a policy. So we will also be performing authorization, typically in most cases when deploying that one x And authorization in case of this technology is going to be performed using either a downloadable access list or VLAN assignment. Right, let's now take a look at the main a2 1x components. So first and foremost, we will be dealing with some sort of software that understands A2 1x implementation. This is what we will have to install on our clients so they can start talking that one X. We will have what is known as an authenticator, which is going to be our device that enforces a policy. So in case of wired networks, it will be simply a switch. In case of wireless, it will be an access point, or if you're using unified wireless architecture, it could be wireless LAN controller. And the third component is going to be our authentication server, which will be always a radius box. And the reason for it is that TACX Plus does not understand EAP packets, so we cannot use TACX Plus for that one x authentication. Now, from a high-level perspective, the authentication process is going to start on a reception of so-called EAP request identity packet 
from our authenticator. And this packet is sent periodically. But in addition to that, it is also generated when a switch detects a link change when an interface on a switch goes up. And also when a switch or our access point WLC receives an IP start message, where IP start message is something that is generated by the client station, uh, which is used to tell our authenticator that we want to start the authentication. So our switch or access point is going to act as a proxy in the, in the exchange here during the authentication. And specifically, the authenticator is going to divide this communication between this applicant and the server into two separate parts. So we are going to be using keep over LAN packets between the supplicant, which is our client, and our authenticator. And then our authenticator is going to be talking to our server using radius protocol. So there are two special radius attributes that authenticator is going to be using to encapsulate that IP data so it can be delivered to our server. And then when it gets the replies from the server, it will re-encapsulate the content into IP over LAN and send it to the supplicant. So it's like two separate parts, two separate communications that will happen during the authentication process. And our authenticator is going to act as a proxy here. Okay, so at some point during the process, the devices will finally negotiate an authentication method, which will be generally a password or certificate-based authentication solution. And then they will perform the actual authentication. So just to show you the process at a diagram here, I opened one of the Cisco's documents. This is one of the switch configuration guides you can find on the Cisco's website. It's like it's just an illustration that is showing us how the authentication process is going to look like from a high level perspective. And it is showing us the general exchange that applies to both wired and wireless communication. So the switch could be also replaced with an access point or basically WLC. So we see that in, in this case, particular case, we assume that it's going to be our client what is sending that IP over LAN start packet to speed up the authentication process. Remember that the start frame is telling our, in this case, switch, that we want to start authentication. And this is going to be especially useful when we are connecting for an IP phone. Because when you plug in a laptop to your IP phone, this obviously doesn't change link status between the phone and the switch. So the switch would normally not know that a new device connected to one of its ports for a phone. And we would have to wait for the periodic request identity frame, which can take several seconds. So this is why we can generate that IP overland start frame to speed up this authentication. OK, so then the switch replies with that request identity packet. So we will have to provide our identity, which is translated by our authenticator into access request packet. So we see here that on the left, left side portion of this drawing, it is using IP over LAN encapsulation versus the right, right hand portion is using radius for communication. And then the devices will perform the actual negotiation of the authentication method. In this case, the negotiated authentication solution is going to be using one-time passwords, but it, it could be a different method. It could be something that is using certificates, for example. So if over LAN messages are again, they are converted, the requests and responses, this is what we use for negotiation of the authentication method. This is then converted into a bunch of access challenge packets between the switch and our server. And finally, the selected authentication method is, is going to the server as an access request. And our server is going to reply either with radius access accept packet, which is sent when authentication is successful. And this packet is also possibly going to include some authorization data, like for example, a VLAN number. So access accept is then converted to if success. And one possible scenario that we would also, you could also see at that point would be when authentication 
fails. So if authentication fails, we would see access reject message being generated by the server and it will be translated to if failure packet by our switch or an access point. So this, this means that authentication failed and based on the original specification of that one X, it would mean that we would essentially block access to the network. And wireless that one X is like the original specification. So deny blocking access to failing authentication means block access and then try to re-authenticate after a so-called quiet period. But in case of wired networks on the Cisco's implementation, when you fail authentication, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will not have any access to the network. You could still do two different things at that point. You could either say that you want to try a different authentication method, like for example, MAC authentication bypass or web authentication, which is behind the scope of this session, or you could assign a device to authentication fail VLAN, which is like a separate VLAN with limited connectivity. Now the configuration of this feature, we are gonna, we're going to take a look at it for wired networks. It is going to start with enabling the AAA framework. So we will have to say AAA in the model. Then we will have to define what device is our radius server, or basically is going to act as our authentication server. So we will have to say radius server host and specify an IP address of the server, specify a key to protect our password, or the new syntax is to say radius server, give it a name, and then within the radius server configuration mode, specify the key and an IP address. Okay, next step is going to be to enable the dot one x authentication framework globally, dot one x system authentication control command, and then we'll have to configure our method list for authentication with dot one x, and it is always going to be a default list. Then we will be moving on to a switch port where we want to enable dot one x. So at the end of the day, we'll be enabling this authentication on a per port basis. And the first thing you want to do on the port is going to be to enable, change the switch port mode to access, like if this is a single device, what we'll be connecting here. This command is needed so you can get access, see the actual authentication commands, which is how you enable that one X. So you will have to activate it by saying authentication port control addo. And then you will also have to make sure that this particular interface is acting as an authenticator. So it's like when you're telling the switch that it should be acting as a switch in the dot one x exchange. And this is done using that dot one x PAE authenticator command. We're now going to take a look at bring your own device or just BYOD concept. Bring your own device is a concept that was created to allow employees of an organization to use their personal devices to access corporate resources. Like for example, you are leaving your office, you're not taking your laptop with you, you're going home, and when you're at home, you will use your personal, let's say, iPhone or a tablet to, to read corporate emails. So we are still in touch with what is going on in the organization. So we could use your personal devices to access certain corporate resources. And originally it was something as simple as just reading emails that you normally can access, can read from the organization. And this is obviously a flexible solution uh, from the employee's perspective. But if we think about that from the organization standpoint, this solution can bring a lot of different vulnerabilities it's not deemed as a secure option of accessing corporate resources by default. There are a lot of different potential issues we can run into when we allow to people to use their personal equipment. Well, first and foremost, not all access methods that they will be using to get to the corporate network are inherently secure. Well, obviously, if they have some sort of VPN software installed on those devices, they're probably good. 
But think about situations when they connect from a public hotspot, maybe um, external wired or wireless network, or maybe when they just use mobile connectivity to get inside. Many of those networks access methods are not secured, and we have to think about things like you know encryption, integrity of the data. Another thing that we will not be able to tell initially is what do those guys actually have on those on their, on their personal devices? Well, we don't really know what kind of patches um, do they have installed on their underlying operating system. Well, even worse, we don't know what is their operating system. We don't know if they have some sort of antivirus software installed. Even if they have, if it is up to date, we don't know that initially. We don't even know if they have some sort of a malware installed, which they might not be even aware of. But this malware, if this is something like, for example, a Trojan program or a backdoor, could be potentially used by an external attacker to access our network, corporate network, for those personal devices. Because assuming that they are able to connect to our network, even if this is going to be a VPN, if this device got previously compromised, people from the outside could potentially get into our network through that secure VPN connection from the internet. So there is a lot of different things we have to think about before we deploy or bring your own device in our organization. And the way that Cisco does that, the Cisco uses a concept of so-called TrustSec network, which is a model for deploying secure environments that support bring your own device. So bring your own device in case of Cisco is going to consist of multiple components. I mean that the network itself is going to have is going to be built using multiple different technologies and devices where those devices and technologies are supposed to provide for flexible access to the network by using those personal devices but in a secure fashion. So first and foremost, we are obviously going to be dealing with our personal devices like laptops, tablets, phones. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the mobile stuff, what we call a BYOD device. It could be a laptop, it could be a notebook that belongs to the organization, but we might want to take it out when we leave the office. For example, when we go to a hotel or go back to our home. Okay, we will have first and foremost identity services engine, which is the powerful advanced identity management solution that offers those flexible AAA services, authentication, authorization, and accounting. It offers the serious advanced policy enforcement options and some other advanced features like, for example, profiling or device onboarding, which are going to be especially useful for BYOD. We have our network access devices. So depending on the type of connection, like wired versus wireless versus VPN, we will have to think about our wireless LAN controllers, about our access points, obviously router switches for wired connectivity, ASA firewalls like when you are using a VPN tunnel to, to, to get access to the, to the network. So those devices will be located in different portions of our network, like for example, the internet edge versus data center versus a campus, and they should all be able to, to support this BYOD deployment. Okay, what other components do we have that Cisco recommends for secure a deployment, it's going to be definitely our AnyConnect mobile client, which is going to act as a VPN and A2.1x client. So in case of .1x, AnyConnect is acting as a supplicant. In case of VPNs, it is acting as a SSL or IPsec client. We will have what is known as a Cloud Web Security, CWS, which we will use to scan communication which is originated on those BYOD endpoints when it is accessing certain websites like on the internet. We will have our authentication database, like for example, Active Directory, which could be integrated with an external 
additional database like with an OTP or just one-time password RSA server. And this is to ensure that we will be able to determine an identity of a connecting user or device. And we will probably have some sort of a public key infrastructure in place with our corporate certificate authority so we can issue certificates to those BYOD legitimate endpoints so we can tell if this particular device is part of our corporate network or, or not. So even though this is going to be a personal device, we will have to somehow deliver a certificate to this device so it can authenticate and this way we will be able to tell if this device is a legitimate BYOD endpoint. Okay, some organizations they also apply what is known as mobile device management system. They kind of like created this additional element to the regular infrastructure that and the technologies that come from Cisco. So mobile device management or MDM is, is an additional software and hardware that we will use to better manage our BYOD endpoints. And first and foremost, it is going to allow us to enforce some additional policy on BYOD endpoints. We will be able to specify, configure our password policy, like to determine the minimum number of characters, maybe type of characters that a given password must consist of. This is to prevent against the brute force attacks. Uh, we will be able to enforce a pin lock on our endpoints so that you will not be able to use the, the device unless you know the right code to access it. Uh, we will be able to encrypt the data or basically to enforce encryption so you will be able to, for example, disallow access from the devices that don't support encryption. And we will also we will be also able to control our corporate data so they don't leak out of those BYOD endpoints to the outside. Okay, another thing we may want to do with um, MDM is to remotely control BYOD endpoints. And this is for situations when our device gets either stolen or lost. So we might want to have that option to remotely wipe out all the data stored on such a device. And this solution is also going to allow us detect modifications, unauthorized modifications performed on the underlying operating system of our endpoint. Like for example, if someone is playing with the registry settings or maybe trying to install certain application to get remote unauthorized access to that endpoint. We will be able to detect such attempts and when this happens we will be able to block access from a compromised device. Okay, MDM can be deployed using two different methods. We can deploy our system on premise or in the cloud where when I say on-premise, it means that we will be deploying it in our internal network. And this can be generally done in the data center or on the DMZ in our internet edge. Well, obviously the drawback of this solution is that the whole setup configuration and maintenance is going to be our job. We will have to deploy the system, we will have to have a crew who will manage that, that system, who will control uh, this configuration, but the benefit is that we will have a full control over the information that this system uses, uh, which means that our intellectual property will be will be properly secured, assuming that we properly secure our internal data. With the cloud-based solution, it's like when we will be hosting this MDM platform on an external provider, which um, obviously means that it will be far easier to deploy uh, this on cloud version of MDM because the entire infrastructure, software, hardware, even people who manage that solution are, don't belong to our organization. We'll just have to pay a fee like a monthly or yearly subscription and we will get access to, to MDM platform pretty much immediately. So it is also a faster to deploy solution. But a drawback is that we will not have full control over our own data. 
So like with pretty much any other cloud-based solution, those this option is generally deemed as less secure because we cannot really tell what happens with our internal information and data. 